It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, before I begin, I think I just want to um, relay, I think on behalf of all of the MPPs in the Legislature, our uh, sincere concern and worry about the fire that's happening at uh, York Memorial Collegiate Institute and all of the f staff and faculty and students who um, you know, who attend there and who work there. It's devastating to see that institution go up in flames on its 90th anniversary, wow. so uh, I think it's just important to acknowledge that. Speaker, my, my first question is to the Premier. Does the Premier think getting beer into corner stores is more important than vaccinating children or providing school breakfast programs? Questions to the Premier. You can't make those kinds of uh, interjections in the House. We're going to ask you to leave. Order. People interjecting have to leave. I'm going to remind everyone who is here as a guest that we're pleased to have you here to view and listen to the proceedings of Parliament, but you can't interject, you can't yell at the members on the floor. To do so disrupts the proceedings of Parliament. We have no choice but to ask you to leave if you do that. And all of you know, and you're informed when you come in, that you can't do that. So please respect Parliament, those of you who are left. Restart the clock. The Premier, head the floor. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we're putting $433 million into Toronto Public Health. We're putting $2 billion right across the province. But, Mr. Speaker, why are we doing this? We're doing this to make sure that we support the things that matter to people, things that matter to families, matter to their children, and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable if we continue spending. We have a $347 billion debt. We have a $15 billion deficit. Mr. Speaker, the students in, in, the, in the stands up there, they're worried about their parents making sure they keep a job. We're creating jobs. We created 123,000 jobs. We lowered their taxes. When Response. they go home, their parents will see a lower heating cost. Instead of a higher heating cost, we're putting money back into their pockets. It's unsustainable. You can't keep spending. The opposition, all they want to do is spend the tax. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Seems to me the Premier wants to spend the people's money on campaign stickers on gas pumps, Speaker. That's not a priority to Ontarians. The Mayor of Toronto yesterday challenged the Premier's misplaced priorities and his reckless cuts to public health, but he's not alone. Mayors across Ontario say the Premier is engaged in downloading by stealth. And just yesterday, the City of London announced that the Ford government cuts have created a $4 million hole in their budget. Meanwhile, doctors and frontline health workers say cuts to public health will put families at risk and make hallway medicine even worse. Does the Premier really believe all these people are, to use his own words, irresponsibly wading into issues that they don't understand. Premier to reply. To you, Mr. Speaker, the only thing irresponsible is the rhetoric coming from the other side. All they want to do is continue to spend the taxpayers' money. As they run their households, as they run their small businesses, people around this province, you can't spend more than what you take in. It's very simple. They don't understand math. We understand math. 
The only way we're going to protect health care, the only way we're going to protect education, by the way, we put $700 million more into education. Every teacher is keeping their job because we put a safety net of $1.6 billion. The only way you can do that, Mr. Speaker, is take care of your balance sheet. They don't understand that. They would spend, spend, spend. They bankrupt this province. We inherited a bankrupt province through the Liberals that the NDP supported 98 percent of the Response. time. It's irresponsible. They do not know how to run a fiscal balance sheet if their life depended on it. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Final supplementary. These would be the same small businesses that don't want the Premier's campaign stickers on their uh, on their uh, gas tanks. You know, at some point, the Premier has to realize that funding cuts and insults are no way to build a health care system. Yesterday, the chair of the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington Board of Health laid out the dangers of public health cuts, and I quote, we simply cannot afford to have any infectious outbreak like SARS or water contamination event like Walkerton. History tells us the next threat is just around the corner. These cuts to our health care system put all of us at risk, Speaker. Do we have to wait until the next disaster before order, the Premier order. understands what happens when you roll the dice with health care cuts? Premier. Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Referred to the Deputy Premier, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And the, the reality is that we are investing more money in health care, over a billion dollars more in health care. But I think it's important to note that we are focusing on what matters the most, what counts the most. And we have we were elected by the people last June to do that. People know that we were spending more than $40 million a day than we were taking in. That is not sustainable. So we are asking our public health units to do the same, to focus on the key priorities, to focus on the things that count the most, to make sure that children get vaccinated, to make sure that the school breakfast programs continue, to make sure that children with special needs continue to get the help that they get. If they continue to focus on those priorities, there will be enough money to make sure those basics are covered. But what happened with the City of Toronto? What have Response. they done? They've had a surplus in their public health budget over the last 10 years to a total of $52 million. In other parts of their budget, they've spent money with tree maintenance programs. Thank you. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, my next question is to the Premier, but I have to say it's pretty disgusting that this government promised no cuts to health care and no cuts to education in that campaign, and yet that's exactly what Sorry. they're doing. If public health is not the most important issue, I don't know what is. Parents across Ontario are worried about the Premier's reckless cuts to child care across Ontario. Yesterday, government the Premier side, dismissed order. concerns from his former ally, the Deputy Mayor of Toronto, but virtually every municipality across Ontario is facing direct cuts to child care funding. Today, mothers from across Ontario have come to Queen's Park to express their concern. Will the Premier listen, or will he tell them not to meddle in issues that they don't understand? <laughs> Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, I would like to share a quote from a press release titled Licensed Day Care Operators See Opportunities for Municipal Savings. And I'd like to quote specifically what I shared with you yesterday. The reaction by some municipal officials have been totally over the top, says Andrea Hannon, Executive Director of the Association of Day Care Operators in Ontario. It's like they want families to start panicking. The fact of the matter is there's been a lot of waste in the system for a very long time. And the fact is, we recognize that there's opportunity to realize efficiencies, but most importantly, we recognize we must make sure that parents are the center of every decision around child care for their families, as opposed to governments telling them where they need to go and what they need to do. And more importantly, making sure that parents are part of the, the decision-making is central, but we also want to make sure that we're leaving money in parents' pockets. Our, our child care plan is going Going to enable 300,000 families. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, apparently, parents in this minister's own writing wrote an open letter today begging her to fund childcare, not for profit, high quality, a 
affordable childcare is what parents want, Speaker. The Premier is creating a crisis here, and it won't disappear just because he denies that it's happening or insults people that raise concerns. One parent joining us today is from the riding of Huron-Bruce. She warns that the government cuts to childcare will, quote, uh, make childcare harder to access, more expensive, and will put young children and families at risk. Does the Premier deny his cuts will impact families that rely on programs that are losing funding? Well, again, just like any MPP in our government, we encourage all our constituents to come to us directly and work with us because the fact of the matter is we look forward to meeting with our constituents because we are absolutely listening to our grassroots. And our grassroots have told us that they are tired of government taking money out of their pockets left and right. And so the fact of the matter is we're making sure that families feel supported like no other time before. In the, or like over the last 15 years. We're investing over $2 billion, as I said. Any family that has a children or has a child between the age of zero and seven actually get a support of six thousand dollars a year for per child in the family Order. over and above that from ages Order. seven to sixteen they get support a tax credit of seven thousand seven hundred and fifty and families with special needs children can get an eight thousand two hundred and fifty dollar tax credit thank you very much final supplementary well, Speaker, the fact is that this government kept these cuts hidden from families because they know how shameful and heartless yeah. they really are. And they know they are targeting families who are in the most need in our province, Speaker. The Premier did not receive a mandate to slash not-for-profit childcare funding for families across Ontario. That was not what he promised on the campaign trail. Nobody voted, Speaker, to see fewer options for affordable childcare. Why is the government targeting children and low income families with his cuts. Members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. Well, again, this is about getting things right, and we know across the province there are opportunities not only for the likes of the City of Toronto but municipalities across Ontario to take a look at their administration and realize some efficiencies to make sure that the focus of child care supports coming from my ministry is focused on families. Again, we're making sure that there is flexibility, affordability, and accessibility to all families in every corner of this province. We, we are actually making sure that for the first time, people who have a right to choose between in-centre care, in-home care, or summer camps. And the fact of the matter is, all of those expenses will be covered off. 75 per cent of child care expenses will be covered off by our, our care, our tax Response. credit. So the fact of the matter is, we are getting it right. We've listened to parents, and shame on this government, our opposition for government, yeah, official opposition of government, the official opposition of government. I'm going to ask the opposition to come forward. Order. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier, but I have to say it is not right. It is wrong to cut on the backs of the most vulnerable, vulnerable families and children in our province. It is wrong. Not right. The Premier's cut speaker are being felt across Ontario and the schools side, from order. one end of the province to the other. Just this week, we've seen reports of nearly 40 classes being removed from a secondary school in Stouffville, with subjects like media studies, music, history and French all being scrapped because the Premier fired the people who teach those courses. Yep. Does the Premier really think it's appropriate to target cuts order. at our students? Questions to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's very difficult to sit here and listen to inaccurate statements. Just totally inaccurate, Mr. Speaker. I'll tell you what we did side. promise. We promised to get a bankrupt province out of bankruptcy to make sure we protect the real people in this province. The people are working in the factories, people are working in the offices, struggling to pay their mortgage. We're lowering their taxes. We created 123,000 jobs. There's 123,000 people that weren't working before because 
Before, businesses didn't have any confidence in the Liberal government or the NDP government. They're as happy as punch right now that we're being fiscally responsible. We're driving the economy. We're making sure we're creating good-paying jobs. Companies are flooding in all over the place. So the students up there, their parents are going to have a sustainable job. They're going to have lower taxes. They're going to have lower bills because of our government, not because of the spendthrift NDP and Liberal policies. Yeah. Stop, stop. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, struggling families are struggling even more under this government. And you know what? They're struggling because they didn't get their $15 minimum wage, what they should have got, to help actually pay the bills. But look, the question order. was about students, and so I'm going to get back to that, Speaker. Government For many students, these classes laid out a clear path towards fulfilling post-secondary education and a career. Now they are being left to try to piece together a schedule that doesn't reflect their interests or their potential. Stu Ontario students are watching as the Premier tears up their plans for their education, leaving them to pick up the pieces. Why is the Premier so determined? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. There is a standing order that says that interjections are out of order. That means you can't yell across the floor at the person who has the floor. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition for interrupting. Restart the clock. She has the floor. The question is, why is the Premier so determined to leave Ontario students with less, less options in our schools and fewer prospects after they graduate? Premier. Minister of Education. Currently, Minister of Education. Speaker, the leader of the opposition is doing nothing but filling people with absolute rhetoric that is nonsense. It's not true. And the fact order. of the matter is, you are the opposition and the order. opposition party behind her is actually doing a disfavor because the fact of the matter is, we're going to be working with school boards because we have an attrition protection program, for goodness sakes. $1.6 billion, not one teacher is going to involuntarily lose their job, and if there is a teacher Opposition that to is order. going to be retiring that perhaps teaches math, that perhaps teaches a technology program, or perhaps teaches arts, we are going to make sure that okay. <laughs> The Minister of Education will take her seat. The, I'm going to call, I'm going to interrupt. I'm going to call the member for Davenport to order and the member for Waterloo to order. Next question. Minister of Education will come to order. Minister of Education will come to order. Next question. The member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, nurses are an incredibly important and valued part of Ontario's health care system. In fact, they are its backbone. They deliver high-quality, compassionate, patient-centered care that Ontario's patients and families can rely on. That is why I am so proud to stand in this legislature to celebrate National Nursing Week. I am also proud to be a part of a government that values the hard work of Ontario's nurses. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier please explain to the members of this legislature why it is so important to celebrate National Nursing Week in our province? Questions addressed to the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the great member from Mississauga Centre for the question. You do an incredible job. Premier, I'm going to have to interrupt. Stop the clock. I'm going to have to interrupt. The minister, I'm gonna, I have to interrupt. Please sit, take your seat. The clock stop. The member for Waterloo and the Minister of Education have to come to order. Start the clock. The Premier. Sir. Thank, thank you, Speaker. 
Wow. You know, Mr. Speaker, we have to recognize National Nursing Week because they're incredible people. I said throughout the campaign, and the opposition want to make fun of me of saying I love the nurses. I truly do love the nurses because I've had many experiences, like all of us have. When you take a loved one into the hospital, of course, the, the, the doctors are there overseeing everything, but the backbone of every single hospital, Mr. Speaker, are the nurses. The nurses are there around the clock. The nurses are taking care of the patients, making sure they're feeling better. And, Mr. Speaker, there's no one that appreciates nurses more than our team, our Fonts. caucus, our PC government, and we're going to make sure we take care of the nurses. Because, again, Mr. Speaker, they are the backbone of every hospital throughout this. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. I thank the Premier for his response. There is no doubt that our nurses right here in Ontario are the best, and I know that it means a lot to everyone in the healthcare sector that we have steadfast leadership in our Premier and our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, who care so deeply about what matters the most. That is why I am proud to be a part of a government that supports the hard work and sacrifices of our nurses across Ontario. Our government is committed to supporting frontline nurses by ensuring that they have the tools they need to provide the highest quality, patient-centered care for Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier please inform this House what our government is doing to support nurses across Ontario? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I forgot to mention uh, the MPP from Mississauga is actually a nurse. She's actually a nurse. She, no one understands it better. My Minister of Labour was a nurse. We have lots of nurses, so we hear firsthand, firsthand their needs, firsthand when it's in the middle of the night and they have two nurses on duty on a whole floor. That's what concerns our government. We need to support our nurses, which we will support our nurses, because again. When the patients need help and they need to be taking care of the patients, who takes care of them? The nurses. So we need to take care of the nurses. My, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the nurses out there they'll be well taken care of. We'll listen to their concerns because no one understands the health care sector Response. better than the frontline people. The nurses that are there day in and day out. They see the struggles. They see the struggles with the patients. They see the struggles with the doctors and the nurses. Nurses are absolute champions. Thank you. The next question is the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday, John Tory, the distinguished mayor of Toronto and former leader of the Premier's party, said that since the Premier had so many budgeting suggestions for the City of Toronto, maybe the City of Toronto would reciprocate by helping the Ford government find waste in their own budget. Speaker, New Democrats would like to help the mayor identify the most wasteful spending in the Ford government's budget, but we're struggling to decide between which one. Speaker, there's the House Leader's secret junket to India, the Finance Minister visit to the Big Apple, the current billion-dollar beer store boondoggle, and of course, who could forget the Premier's off-the-books personal pleasure wagon. Speaker, can the Premier help us help Mayor Tory? Questions to the Mr. Premier. Speaker, I'd be more than happy to help the City of Toronto find savings. I was down there for four years. We saved over a billion dollars. Where's the savings now? All you've seen in the City of Toronto, the budget go up billions of dollars over the last number of Position years. Come to order. The services have gone down and the spending has gone up. Who goes out and buys $10 million fleet and has it sitting in the basement and does nothing? Who goes around paying people to water stumps on trees? You know, the Auditor General, the Auditor from the City of Toronto has given them a, a lengthy list of savings. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? The City of Toronto has ignored them. Name one efficiency, anyone in this room, one efficiency Toronto has found in the last five, six Spons. years. I can tell you not one, not one Let's single efficiency. All they do is waste money. They're part of the NDP liberal uh, little gang over there that loves to spend. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, we know uh, that we barely scratched the surface when it comes to this government's indefensible spending, but we understand the Premier has asked Mayor Tory not to meddle in provincial affairs. The Premier has criticized the Mayor for irresponsibly wading into provincial issues that he is either not involved in or doesn't understand. And, you know, we get it, Speaker. It's annoying when another level of government irresponsibly wades into issues that they aren't involved in and they really don't understand. Speaker, can the Premier explain why he does it so often? Premier. <laughs> Members of the opposition, please take your seats. Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the City of Toronto has over a $13 billion budget. We just took $20 billion. We took over $20 billion Never off their books from on. backlog repairs. We're delivering a $28.5 billion transit system. We're giving Toronto Health $433 million. We're supporting the City of Toronto like no other government. But I, I, I remember one thing, Mr. Speaker. When I was at the City of Toronto, we never came hat in hand to the government. Not Position once. Because as they were spending, we were saving. As they were raising taxes, we were lowering taxes. Matter of fact, the first year, Mr. Speaker, we delivered a 0% tax increase. They don't understand that. Mr. Speaker, just imagine. If they took care of all their constituents that voted for them and ran their government and we ran ours, they'd be bankrupt in a month. Absolute bankrupt. The member for Essex has to come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre has to come to order. Next question, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. This week is Mental Health Week. It is an important time to raise awareness to help end the stigma around mental health. That's why I'm very proud to be part of a government that is committed to develop and implement a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction strategy, not just this week, but every week. I heard time and time again from my constituents of the riding of Scarborough Rouge Park that people cannot access the mental health and addiction services when and where they need it. We need to do better. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please inform the members of this legislature what is being done to support Ontarians living with mental health and addiction challenges? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for this question. I know this is a really important issue for you as well. Ontario's mental health system is disconnected, making it difficult for patients and families to get the care they need when they need it. This fragmented approach to treating Ontario's families is simply not good enough. That's why our government has added desperately needed mental health and addiction services on the ground, in schools, communities and health centres across the province. I was proud to announce yesterday that our government is investing $174 million in new funding to address the critical gaps in Ontario's system and to support patients and families living with mental health and addictions challenges. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister for her response. There is no doubt our mental health and addiction systems needs immediate action. We need better wraparound services so the people of Ontario are supported in their mental health and addiction challenges. My constituents and everyone in Ontario will certainly benefit from these community services, and I'm proud to be part of a government that takes mental health very seriously. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please inform the members of this legislature what this investment of $174 million will be used for? Minister. Well, thank you very much again to the member. Our government is keeping our promise to the people of Ontario to make mental health and addiction services a priority, and that is why we are taking a multi-ministerial approach to Ontario's mental health and addictions challenges. This funding will go directly towards services for patients and families and help reduce wait times, enhance op opioids and addiction services, create additional housing, build capacity in child and youth mental health, 
support our men and women in uniform, and add services for seniors, francophones, and Ontario's Indigenous peoples. These investments are part of our government's commitment to spend $3.8 billion over 10 years in mental health and addiction services. Together, we will create a connected system of care that will make sure that services Response. are available for individuals and families throughout their journey to mental wellness. Thank you. The next question is the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The new Ontario Autism Program was supposed to start April the 1st. Thousands of families across the province have waited anxiously for the new program. Yet to date, not one family in Ontario has received their childhood budget. Wow. This government's reckless rollout of their autism program has actually left parents waiting longer. Families feel like they have been shifted from a bad Liberal waitlist to a Conservative one, with absolutely no end in sight. Premier, how much longer will families have to wait to get the funding for services for their children? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Transportation. Referred to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, for the member opposite for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, last year we came out uh, uh, with a new program for autism in, in, in Ontario. Uh, not only did we double the funding, Mr. Speaker, but uh, we, we went to work at a system that clearly wasn't working for Ontarians. One out of four children only received treatment from their government, Mr. Speaker. We work to end that wait list so that four out of four children are going to receive treatment for support the children with autism throughout this province. And Mr. Speaker, we're doing just that, not only with our, our why is to clear the wait list, but also we're going to support it with complete clear funding. We're up the funding to $600 million. And we've just started a uh, consultation process, Mr. Speaker, to see how we can best move forward towards a needs-based uh, program. This is what parents have been asking for, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to deliver that. And I hope the opposite members will join us in that consultation to develop a program together to ensure that people, children with autism are truly supported. Supplementary question. Just so the minister knows, I've been talking to families for four years, for eight years. You can't put programs before you talk to parents. It's backwards. Families have no idea when they will receive funding for their children with autism. Families who were next on the list under the old OAP are still waiting. It's not clear if this government is withholding funds deliberately or if they're delayed just because they design programs on the fly. Families shouldn't have to wait for the Conservatives to get their house in order. Premier, when can families expect to receive not just application packages, but actual funding to purchase the services that their children need? Minister of Reply. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, for that question. You know, previously, prior to our changes, three out of four children in this province were not receiving any funding and were indefinitely placed on a wait list, Mr. Speaker. It seems like the member opposite and the opposition wants to return to that type of system where three out of four children in this province do not receive any funding and only have zero hope to get off that wait list. Mr. Speaker, we're making a change this province. We're putting more money in. The minister has put more money into the system. We're working to make sure that four out of four children with autism receive the support and care that they need in this province. Order. Not only have we started consultation for a needs-based system, Mr. Speaker, but we're working with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Education to create wraparound services. It's something the opposition has been asking for, Mr. Speaker, wraparound services for children with autism. We're going to continue to deliver on that program. We're consulting right now. We're listening to parents. I would hope the members opposite would help work with us to help Response. parents with children with autism get the support and services they need. Next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The speaker, through you to the Premier. Uh, Premier, I hope you slept well uh, to dreams of your double-dip dodge. And I want to follow up on that question that I asked you yesterday. And now that you've had time to think about it, I'd like to present to you some new facts. So on April 29th, Chair, Mr. Speaker, $85,000 was de deposited to your leadership campaign on the way to Conservative Party coffers. 46 people donated the maximum. That's just in the last two weeks. Speaker, the Premier knows this is wrong. It's an unfair advantage. He knows that not any other member in this legislature can do this. It's wrong, and he knows it. I know that. So through you, through you to the Premier, Speaker, 
Does the Premier believe there's one rule for him and another rule for the people? Questions to the Premier. Through, through, you, through you, Mr. Speaker, I think our uh, MPP, the leader of the, uh, the Liberal Independent uh, Party, Liberal Party, whatever you want to call them, he forgets the $20,000 of plate dinners that he would go to with the Premier, with the Minister, running around. We had a, they actually had to change the rules because of what was going on for the pay-to-play. It was called pay-to-play under the Liberal previous government. You go spend $20,000 and you get to have a one-on-one -on -one with the minister. Shame. You might even be able to get a one-on-one -on -one with the premier. We're raising money around the province, $25 spaghetti dinners. The majority of our, we'll, we'll put out a statement, Mr. Speaker, and we'll, in between $5, $10, and $25, we'll raise $100,000 because people believe in our message. They believe in what we're doing. They believe we're turning the Response. province around and putting more money in their pocket. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And the Premier might want to check his own website because the LCBO chair is raising money for his finance minister and it's not a $25 spaghetti dinner. Yeah. So, Premier, on April 29th, 34 people exceeded their annual contribution limits. You asked them, you said, you asked them, you said, give me money for my leadership and then give me some more money for the Conservative Party. And you know, you know that this is wrong. Okay, you have to make your comments through the chair and the, and the uh, question has to be relevant. Come to order. Thank, thank you, Speaker. The Premier knows that this is wrong, okay? So you're closing in on three quarters of a million dollars to a leadership campaign. The government side, the no and, you know, the millionaire Premier and the millionaire finance minister, Speaker, may believe that this is okay. Question. For, for, for regular folks, this is a lot of money, Speaker. So I want to ask the Premier one more time does he believe there's a rule just for him? Thank you. Premier to reply. That's why you're in the through, through you, Mr. Speaker, we had to change the rules because of all the nonsense going on with the Liberal Party. They were filled with scandal, deceit, backroom deals, Mr. Speaker. And ask the Premier to withdraw. withdraw. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, they were attending $20,000 of plate dinners. We, we're raising money from people again with the $5, $25, $30 donations. They actually, Mr. Speaker, they actually changed the green belt boundaries to suit their developer buddies. They switched it. Matter of fact, they switched the green belt 19 times, Mr. Speaker, to suit the development buddies. 19 times. We wouldn't even mention it. And people go wild. They changed it 19 times because it's called Pay to play under the Liberal Party. Order. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the minister everyone loves, the caring minister for seniors and accessibility. Mr. Speaker, recently the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility and our Minister of Health and Long-Term Care announced publicly funded dental care for low-income seniors. Mr. Speaker, no senior in Ontario should ever, ever have to go without quality dental care. Yet we know many seniors live in a fixed income, and two-thirds of our low-income seniors do not have any access to dental insurance. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility please inform this House what our government is doing for low-income seniors with their dental care. Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, I'd like to thank a very hard-working member for raising very important questions. Yeah. Our government is protecting what matters most, yes. our seniors. Yeah. We recognize Living on a fixed income can create gaps in care, something that many seniors in Ontario face. That's why we introduced our dental care program for low-income seniors, which will help reduce unnecessary trips to the hospital, yep. prevent chronic disease, 
and increase quality of life for our seniors. During the campaign, we promised dental care mm -hmm. for our low-income seniors. And this, this government introduced the program in our budget. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the minister to take his seat. Supplementary question. Well, I, I certainly thank the minister for his response. I know seniors in my constituency and literally in every constituency of every member here uh, certainly need a program such as this. And this is a, a program that takes the health needs of our seniors seriously. Because not only though is it beneficial for our seniors, but it's also beneficial for our larger public health care system here in the province of Ontario. So can the minister as well please explain how this program contributes to our government's larger plan that's going to modernize the Ontario health care system and hallway health care and finally bring proper care back to our seniors in this province. Here, here. Minister. Thank you for the, the sub supplementary question. I'd like to refer that question to hard-working, my favorite minister of what? health and long-term care. Oh. <laughs> Referred to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington as well for the original question. Preventable dental issues lead to more than 60,000 emergency room visits per year, a significant portion of which are seniors. This puts a strain on our hospitals and is a failure to our seniors. No senior in Ontario should go without quality dental <coughs> care. That's why we are investing nearly $90 million per year in dental care for low-income seniors. Public health units, community health centres, Aboriginal health Response. access centres and mobile dental buses will assist Ontario seniors with their dental needs. Ontario seniors can be confident that their public health care system will be there for them when and where they need it. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, legal aid clinics are looking at an approximate $16 million cut to their overall budgets. The South Asian Legal Clinic is one, uh, but one of 73 legal aid clinics in this province. They, like others uh, across our province right now, provide counsel and legal representation to some of the most vulnerable people here in our province. Like a woman they refer to as Miriam, a new immigrant and a tenant in Mississauga. Her landlord kept turning up at her unit without a notice. On one occasion, she complained that her landlord even assaulted her. After that came the threat of eviction. The legal aid clinic worked with Miriam to ensure that she was not evicted and to get compensation that she deserved for her injuries. Speaker, where does the Premier suggest thousands of people like Miriam go to get the help they need? The question is to the Deputy Premier. Stop the clock. You have to leave. Those of you who are protesting have to leave. Order. 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 The House will come to 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 order. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, is warned. The member for Sarnia Lambton will come to order. Member for Niagara Centre will come to order. 
The member for Essex will come to order. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. Where were we? The floor. Deputy Premier. Start the clock. The Deputy Premier has the floor. Attorney General, Speaker. Refer to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will uh, be very happy to answer the question from the member opposite um, and speak to the vital services that legal aid provides, including to people such as Miriam. But I do want to point out that the, uh, the photographer from the uh, opposition party has been in the gallery today, and it looks as though the opposition has been coordinating an, eff uh, an effort to disrupt this House. Government side will come to order. The government side will come to order. Start the clock. The Attorney General, please conclude your response. Mr. Speaker, legal aid provides vital services, and that is why it is essential that we do everything we can to ensure that it has accountability and transparency and that it is sending the, the hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars to the frontline services that are so desperately needed. Mr. Speaker, over the last Response. few years, we have seen legal aid spending hundreds, almost $100 million more, and people, legal aid clients and taxpayers have not been seeing the results that they should expect from that kind of investment, Mr. Speaker. And so, therefore, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. The member for Brampton Centre. Speaker, a worker we will refer to as Imran worked for an employer who paid him only $7 an hour, even though our minimum wage here in this province is $14. The legal aid clinic helped Imran make an employment standards claim for his wages, overtime, and termination pay. Imran says that without that help, he would not have been able to get what was owed to him, and he is grateful for the clinic's support. This government's cut put these clinics at risk and the closure and the of, of closure and the attorney general knows that this is the case is it the premier's intention to close legal aid clinics so that people like imran can't get the wages that they are actually owed the attorney general Mr. S Mr. Speaker, Legal Aid has said itself that frontline services will continue to remain strong. So the services that people such as Imran have received will continue to be offered, Mr. Speaker. Legal Aid has a budget of over $400 million this year, and it'll have even more if the federal government commits to pay the funding that it is responsible for. While some lawyers may not, may not, may not welcome this renewed accountability at Legal Aid, Mr. Speaker, it is essential for Legal Aid clients and for the taxpayer of Ontario that is spending so much money to ensure that those people in Ontario who cannot afford legal representation are able to get that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Vice Premier. Gambling Research Exchange Ontario has been studying problem gambling and finding ways to help reduce the arm of gambling, providing resources to frontline agencies to prevent gambling addictions. Last week, the government announced that it is cutting their entire budget, shutting down the organization. Speaker. As this government continues its crusade to expand alcohol and gaming access across Ontario, including free alcohol in casino and casinos, why? Why is this government not concerned about those most vulnerable people affected by gambling addictions? Questions to the Deputy Premier. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. Of course, we are concerned about people with gambling addictions, but we are also concerned about making sure that we put resources on the front line where people really need the assistance. So we have made the decision to redirect all available resources to the front lines. We have to wind down 
some of the research programs. So we are committed to supporting an effective and respectful wind-down period for the Gambling Research Exchange Organization. However, we are continuing to invest in programs to uh, prevent gambling prevention and, and to uh, ensure treatment programs, such as with respect to prevention, funding of the Responsible Gaming Council, YMCA, and the Ontario Aboriginal Responsible Gambling Program, made up of seven Indigenous organizations, to implement community-based program gambling prevention in initiatives targeted at po top populations at risk, including children and youth, and ethno-cultural and Indigenous communities. I will have more to say in supplementary. Supplementary question. So, so, Speaker, I appreciate the Deputy Premier's answer, but compared to the net profit of gambling of over $2.4 billion, the $2.5 million annual budget to fund research into problem gaming, I would say, is fair and reasonable, especially since we know all too well in this House the effect that problem gambling can have on individuals and families. Mm -hmm. Speaker, this cut follows the trend of this government's retreat from its responsibilities to Ontario's, Ontarians' public well-being, from public health, autism, child care, legal aid, children with disability, the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, we can now add problem gambling. Speaker, this government has talked about paying down the debt. Question. It is willing to pay the cost to have beer in corner stores, but it is unwilling to deal with the gambling addiction. Can the Deputy Premier explain the rationale of not looking? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you. Well, our government is committed to protecting what matters most. We are committed to protecting our education system with an additional $700 million going into that, to protecting our health care system with an additional $1.3 billion going into our health care system. But we also are committed to respecting adult choices by allowing people to make responsible choices that work for them. This includes ensuring the people of Ontario have access to safe and, and legal gambling options, but in terms of, we've already spoken about prevention, but in terms of treatment, it's also important to note that we fund 94 agencies across the province who offer problem gambling services, including treatment for co-occurring substance use programs. So we are addressing the problem, but we want to make sure that the services go directly to the Response. front line. That's what we're committed so to doing, and government. that's what we are going to make sure happens across the province. Thank you. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Last week, the Minister of Transportation introduced legislation called Getting Ontario Moving Act that includes a number of proposed measures that, if passed, will cut red tape, reduce regulatory burdens, and keep Ontario open for business. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people was elected last June with a mandate to grow our economy and make life easier for Ontarians. We have been acting fast to attract new investment, to create and protect jobs, and to reduce regulatory burdens by cutting red tape for businesses. The majority of us in this legislature can all agree that a successful business cannot run when they are burdened with debt and red tape. I know last week's proposed legislation contained a number of measures that, if passed, would cut red tape Question. and reduce burdens for the business Ontarians. Can the Minister of Transportation share some of the proposed measures in the Getting Ontario Moving Act and regulatory postings? Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for that question. Mr. Speaker, last week I was proud to introduce the Getting Ontario Moving Act. This comprehensive piece of legislation, if passed, will cut red tape, save businesses and taxpayers time and money, and help keep Ontario's roads amongst the safest in North America. In addition to the legislation, we'll also be changing many regulations to meet these goals. We are doing this because it's fundamental in our efforts to put people first, getting Ontario moving, and ensure businesses are not bogged down by red tape. Some of the measures we are proposing to cut and reduce are making life easier for people with personal use pickup trucks and trailers by changing regulations to exempt them from burdensome annual inspections and 
reducing the burden on the short-line railway industry by addressing concerns from the industry for the ministry to develop a risk-based short-line rail oversight and burden reduction strategy. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to sharing more in my supplemental. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Minister of Transportation for that great answer, and I know the community uh, of Etobicoke Lakeshore will be pleased with the proposed measures. Mr. Speaker, across this province, individuals who own a pickup truck or a personal trailer have to go through the, the time and expense of getting them inspected as if they were commercial vehicles. This proposed change, if passed, will change that and give people exemptions for personal use vehicles. Additionally, I know that six freight and four tour short line rail operations that are licensed by the province will be thrilled about the burden reduction for this industry if this industry's proposed changes are passed. Can the Minister of Transportation tell us more about the burden reduction measures introduced last week? Minister. Thanks again, uh, Member from Toba Lakeshore, for that question. Mr. Speaker, the Getting Ontario Moving Act, if passed, will make life easier for tourism operators and recreational off-road vehicle drivers by simplifying the rules around off-road vehicles to allow them to operate on municipal roads unless specifically prohibited. Additionally, a proposed regulatory change will amend the vehicle weights and dimensions regulation to allow for the use of advanced technologies such as wide-based single tires. This will harmonize our rules with other jurisdictions to improve industry productivity, reduce fuel consumption, and improve road safety, demonstrating to everyone in the world that Ontario is open for business. Mr. Speaker, these are just but a few great examples of the proposed measures in the Getting Ontario Moving Act and proposed regulation changes. Mr. Speaker, for the people is not just a slogan. Response. It's our guiding principle that drives us each and every day in government. Our government wants to keep goods and people moving by improving its transportation network. It's elect what we're elected to do, and it's what we're going to deliver to this province. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacocca. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, I asked about the demise of the 50 million tree program and its devastating impact on both the environment and the businesses like Ferguson Tree Nursery in Kempville and Milson Forest Industry in Timmins. According to Ed Patchell from Kempville, his business will have to destroy 3 million trees that were intended to be planted in 2020 and 2021. The minister said that Mr. Patchell, I'm sure when he examines what's really happening, will want to change his statement. Mr. Patchell stands by his statement. Mm -hmm. how, can the, how can this government justify cuts that force businesses to literally throw trees in the trash? Shame. The, the question, I guess, the Premier. Great Minister of Natural Resources. Uh, refer to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The, uh, the member for the question. As I said yesterday, the planting of the trees that is scheduled and contracted for this year will go ahead. Forests of Ontario have already indicated that they are looking at other sources to fund the further planting of trees on private property, which also makes it eligible for MIFTIF grant. Speaker, uh, our, our MIFTIF uh, reduction in taxes. Speaker, we are going to ensure that the trees that were contracted for this year will be planted. For further years, Forest Ontario and the nurseries have ample time to look for private funding to plant trees on private property. We want to see that continue, but the taxpayer of Ontario, which was left a $15, $15 billion deficit by the previous Liberal government, which was supported every step Response. of the way that by the NDP, the must make choices. Our choice is that we're going to plant those, have those trees planted this year, but in the future, in the future, they will have to Thank you. Question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry stated that every tree contracted under the 50 million tree program this year will be planted. But according to Forest Ontario, planting this year's trees was never in question. The problem the government has not addressed, however, are the tree seedlings that are already being cultivated to be planted for future years. Mm -hmm. Tree seedlings take approximately three years to grow, as I know the minister knows, because they need to be, uh, for Southern Ontario, they need to be a certain size in order to be viable. This is the unsolved problem for these businesses. 
Will the Premier do the right thing and reverse his decision to cut the 50 million tree program? Yeah. The question has been referred to the Minister. As I have said, the trees that are contracted for this year will be planted. Forests Ontario and all their partners have ample time before next year's planting season and the season after that to do as they have indicated that they were going to do, which was go to the private sector to find that funding, to fill that funding gap. Speaker, we've made it clear, and we made it clear we campaigned on a promise to fix the fiscal mess we were left by the Liberal government, which, as the member knows, was supported by her party every step of the way. We are doing that, and we are making sure that our, the, it's done in a responsible way so that the trees that have been contracted for this year will be planted. Further years, Forest Ontario and its partners have to make alternative arrangements because we have said to Response. the taxpayers of the province of Ontario, we're going to fix the mess that was left us, and this is part of the decision that we've had to make. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to, for the Deputy Premier and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Huh? Mr. Speaker, approximately 2 million people in Ontario currently live with asthma. Living with asthma can be challenging, never knowing when it's going to flare up or how severe it's going to be, making it hard to breathe. And I know the fear of watching helplessly as one of my boys has struggled to breathe after just normal activities. That's why it's so important for my constituents and for the people of Ontario to have proper asthma supports. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the members of this legislature how our government is supporting people in Ontario who are living with asthma? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much to the member from Brantford Brant for your question. I know it's personally very important to you, as it is for many people, and I'm very grateful that the people from Asthma Canada are here today. Mr. Speaker, did you know that one in three people will develop asthma in his or her lifetime, and one in four children will be affected by asthma? Uncontrolled asthma can lead to school and work absenteeism and increases in urgent and acute health care needs. That's why our government is investing up to $4 million in the asthma program. Our government recognizes the need for a coordinated, integrated approach to asthma care in order to improve health outcomes. We will continue to work and listen to partners in frontline care to find innovative solutions and build a health care system that will Response. truly work for the people of Ontario living with asthma. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for her response and for her excellent work on this file and this incredible ministry. There is no doubt that asthma is a serious health issue that needs to be properly addressed. That's why I am so proud to be a part of a government that supports people living with asthma in the province of Ontario. Together, we will create a connected, sustainable, public health care system that truly works for everyone in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please inform the members of this legislature how our government's plan to modernize the health care system will benefit people living with asthma across Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member. And Mr. Speaker, we have committed to the people of Ontario to build a modern sustainable and integrated health system into end hallway health care. Every step of the way, we have put people at the centre of our decisions. We are empowering our nurses and doctors to provide better, faster, integrated care. I know the people living with asthma will appreciate a better connected health care system, one that ensures that they will get connected to the right specialist care, where they don't have to repeat their health care situation over and over again because all of their care providers will have access to the same health records. These are the kinds of changes that are needed to, do, to deliver care that is truly focused on patient, on their families and on their caregivers. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Last year, or yes, last year, the President of the Treasury Board warned that funding for innovation hubs was on the chopping block. For Communitech in Waterloo Region, this warning became a reality last week when they were forced to lay off 15 of their innovators due to the Conservative funding cuts. The government has no research and innovation plan for the province, but innovation hubs like Communitech actually do. 
Communitech does way more than simply support the tech industry in Kitchener-Waterloo. From arts to finance, they have spurred innovation in every facet of Waterloo Region's economic development. These cuts will have a chilling effect on innovation in the region. Mr. Speaker, why is the government cutting investment to our province's most successful economic drivers? Questions to the Premier. President of the Treasury. Refer to the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm glad that my colleagues remember who I am here in the front row. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to, through you to the member opposite for, for that question. Uh, you know, we, uh, I was just up in uh, Cambridge a few weeks ago. I've been up there many times. I've, I've visited the Communitech uh, facilities there. They do a great job. Uh, our government is continuing to focus on innovation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, helped create 123,000 new jobs in this province, with which Communitech has played a role. And I'm very pleased to say that we continue to be the, one of the largest funders for Communitech. Uh, but there has to be a bridge to somewhere, and the private sector has gotten involved. In fact, uh, uh, there were a number of companies that, at my speech uh, in, in Cambridge that supported Communitech and will continue to support the good work that they do. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, this government is focused on protecting good jobs in this province, and we're proud to work with Communitech to continue that uh, path forward. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, Communitech in Kitchener-Waterloo has a proven track record of success. For every public dollar that is invested through Communitech, $22 is returned to the economy. Mr. Speaker, if it was a stock, I would have invested years ago. Despite this, the government went ahead and cut Communitech's funding by one-third, and they were forced to lay off staff. That's 15 more jobs lost in Waterloo Region due to this government. And and your actions. If the government wanted to make Ontario a place to attract investors, they would be doing more, not less, to support organizations like Communitech. Why is the government cutting funding for Ontario-based startups like Communitech when they strengthen the economy, draw investment into Ontario, and create jobs? It is absolutely taking this province backwards. Questions been referred to the Minister. President, Treasury Board, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank you to the other member opposite for that question. You know, the number 15 was mentioned, and uh, it just gave me a flashback and breaking news to the member opposite. We inherited a $15 billion here, here. Oh, deficit, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. They forget about that. And, you know, it's important that uh, we take action because after 15 years, it's the number here, 15 years of inaction and spending by the previous government. We inherited so much debt. Do you know, Mr. Speaker, okay, that this the government, the previous government, government spent $40 million dollars more a day than they took in? Wow. In addition, $30 million dollars of interest expense every single day. That's $70 million dollars that went out every single day. That didn't go to one new hospital, didn't go to one new school, didn't go to one new social program, Mr. Speaker. We got elected on a commitment to take action, Spons. and that's exactly what we're here, doing, here. Mr. Speaker, and we won't tire until the job is done. Here, here. That concludes our question period for today. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning election finances. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. I beg to inform the House that the following document has been tabled, a report concerning the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, from the Office of the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario. The member for Timmins has informed me that he has a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Earlier today, two of our members, the member from Davenport and the member from London Fanshawe, overheard the government member from Flamborough Landbrook say to a protester in the public galleries, please jump. I would like to give the member from Flamborough a chance to apologize or withdraw those comments. Wow. I, I, I have to assume that all members are honourable. I, I didn't hear the comment. Point of order? Order. The attorney. No, I was going to do um, York Southwestern next. Thank you. Member for York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise with a heavy heart order. today on behalf of York Southwestern. I would like to offer my sincere gratitude to the teachers and the staff who acted swiftly to ensure there were no tragedy and uh, casualty to the brave firefighters of the Toronto uh, Fire Service and first responders who put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe. Also, I would like to 
thank my leader, the official uh, opposition leader, uh, on behalf of York Southwestern. Thank you. The Attorney General on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, it appears that the official opposition coordinated an effort to disrupt question period today by bringing in their official photographer to photograph protesters. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, there is a level of decorum here that's required in this House, and that coordinate, coordinated effort disrespected this House as well as yourself, Mr. Speaker. So I ask the members of the office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will say once again. The Speaker has to presume that all members are honourable. There is a procedure for caucuses to uh, seek application to have their, their photographers in the gallery, and I think both sides of the House understand that. Um, I, I'm not going to draw any conclusions beyond that. Uh, this House stands in recess until 3 o'clock this afternoon.